6 Ocala. See you at a gun show. Ocala's Information Station, 1370 WOCA. Ocala! Twenty uh, twenty four minutes before eleven o'clock. Gosh, it's a nice looking Thursday morning. All right, I want to tell you uh, something. When my, when I was a kid, my brother had seahorses, right? Yes. And uh, the seahorses had one of the seahorses had babies, right? And then it was explained that the the male is the one that has the babies. It's like what? Okay. Okay. So I didn't know. Like, does this ever happen? And it was just a, a quirk. What happens? And, and so I guess when I got older, not that I, I'm a scientist in any way, but I learned enough of the science of reproduction to learn mm-hmm. that the the explanation is that the in the seahorses anyway, the female, the female, the female is the one that carries the egg, right? Yes. And the male is the one that carries the sperm. But in the seahorse world, in as opposed to the rest of creation where the male injects the sperm into the female where it meets up with the egg Mm -hmm. am i saying it right in in the seahorse world the female injects the egg into the male where it meets up with the sperm yes and then in that particular animal it develops inside and then lots of little ones come out later on (laughs) lots lots of little ones you you have a a a story robin of a, a young man who used to date your daughter who is now a young woman? <laughs> yes, it's, it's similar in every way. Similar, similar to the um, yeah, similar yeah. to the uh, the the Caitlyn Jenner. Caitlin, Bruce yeah, but Jennifer. no, he went all the way. So he's did his voice change in every way? I am not you sure. I don't know. I, I don't know. The it, this there was a nice story from person. from uh, Caitlyn Jenner that she has a, uh, a a blind friend, an older guy, like a, like a mm-hmm. guy in his nineties, and yeah. she, and uh, I, apparently they had a funny conversation because he can't see her. And she sounds no different, and they don't talk about sexual issues. So, yeah. So when he went to see, when well, I'm sorry, Caitlin. when she, when K, I know, I'm confused. When, but when she goes to see the guy in the, in the nursing home, I guess they've been friends forever. Mm-hmm. He says, "What is all this I hear about you being a woman? You don't sound any different. You're not talking." Any different. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a funny moment. Did you see this yeah. in the news? And, and I thought, well, isn't that kind of funny? Because w- what is sexuality anyway? I mean, from pr- visually, okay, it looks she looks like a woman, but to this guy. It still sounded like Bruce. Yeah. Except that the guy apparently was very open. Bruce, uh, Caitlin's Jenner uh, mother. Did you see that with the mother? Yeah, yeah. She, she was sh- kind of confused, but, but, you know, we don't want to be judgmental of yeah, each other. but she sort of was blaming herself. She didn't see it earlier, so. But, but, yeah. Uh, Peter she Shatner has a very interesting book on the topic of sex and love and DNA. That's the title of the book, Sex, Love, and DNA, What Molecular Biology Teaches Us About Being Human. Peter has a list of credentials. He's a scientist. He's a researcher with 30 years of research experience in molecular biology, genetics, biomedical instrumentation, and physics. He's a teacher. He's the recipient of the Technical Innovation Award from the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine, and he's on the phone. So we're going to pick his brain on this topic because we love talking about sex. Uh, Peter Shatner. Good morning, Peter. Good morning to you, Larry. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from just outside San Francisco, California. Oh, excellent. Uh, d- did you ever own seahorses? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I didn't. I, I, don't, I didn't actually know the seahorse, seahorse sexuality story, but I know many. Uh, my favorite is the cleaner wrasse, which is a type of fish that's born where all the fish are born female, and they live in little harems where there's one male, and when the male dies... Whichever one of the female fish is sort of the most aggressive and uh, strongest and might arguably say the nastiest, suddenly converts and becomes a male and takes over the harem and suddenly stops producing eggs and starts producing sperm. So when you go outside into the animal world, there's almost anything you can imagine that is amazing. does happen. That is wow. amazing. But now in, in the human world, though, let's stick to humans. I guess that's what we want to do. Um, we do we do we confuse sex from gender? Is, is sex a biological word and gender is more of a cultural word? What what is your thought on that? The, the words are, are used kind of loosely by many people. The way I um, use them in my book, just for clarity, is sex is the plumbing. 
sex is, you know, what if you take off your clothes and you look in the pants, that's what you see as the person's sex. Right. Just as a, a way of being clear. And gender, I think of more as the behavior. I'm not sure that's standard uh, language. And and if you talk to three scientists, you might get three slightly different answers. But I think those, that's a useful distinction. Yeah. Both I think of those. So. Yeah, both of those do have bio. Both the plumbing and the behavior have large biological components to them. In the case of the plumbing, we understand them quite well. In the case of the behavior, we understand some things, but much less. So uh, let's let's talk about the the factual stuff, the stuff that's not debatable. If there okay. is if there is such a thing. Um, uh, what what is with the X and Y chromosomes? Let's let's start with that. Does does okay. does that define us at all? That, that's the part that, that's understood really well. And the, the, the development of the plumbing, of uh, what the sexual organs will look like, is a complex process that happens in the fetus, but it starts with the presence or absence of a single gene that's usually on what's called the Y chromosome that is usually something that men have and women don't have. And if you have this gene, and in most cases, you will, it will start a biological process leading to becoming a, an infant boy. And if you don't have it, it will trigger a different biological process, which, which leads to becoming a baby girl. However, there are hundreds of places along that way where if you have certain genetic variations, which are rare but exist, you, the path can be changed. And so you can, the path can switch from the, the usual male development path to the usual female, or it can switch into being some kind of a mixture. And in fact, in many cases, roughly one in 2,000, the delivering doctor can't quite tell whether the infant that they're delivering is a little boy or a little girl. Oh really? Oh wow! And that's well, that's that's a, a condition that's called intersex, and uh, and in some cases there'll be these children will develop and have both ovaries and testes. All of these things exist. They are very rare. One in a thousand births, one in two thousand births. But when you consider how many billions of people there are out there, there are a lot of people who have very unusual. Uh, and I don't say deviant, but very unusual right, sexual right. characteristics. So am, uh, am, I, am, I a, at, am I at the mercy of my hormones, my chemicals? In other words, the, the fact that I am uh, attracted to women, is that because of chemicals inside of me? I, I can't imagine like changing the chemicals and all of a sudden, hello, guys, I love you. <laughs> it, 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 it's a very interesting question. I mean, now we're in the, in the realm of behavior and in terms of sexual attraction. And although much is understood here, much less is understood than about the plumbing. But what I can say is that if you were a mouse, which I understand that you're not, <laughs> then the, hormo the, hor the hormones do control things. There are very interesting experiments where a single hormone, or more precisely a protein, was changed inside a mouse, and the mouse came out, the, the mice came out to me completely normal, except all the female mice were suddenly attracted to other female mice, where, where one measures that by seeing that the female mice wanted to mount them and were sniffing the other females. And other than that, they seemed completely healthy. So in that case, uh, sexual orientation is controlled by a single hormone. In the case of humans, that does not work that way. It's not that simple. We know there are biological things going on and that they're generally outside of our control, but just what those hormones are, how they work, is not understood. Well, you did a study about twins. I didn't personally do the study, but there are In your one book. of the main ways mm -hmm. that one knows that there really is a, a, a biological mm -hmm. component here is there have been large studies, the largest ones were in Australia and in Sweden, where thousands of twins uh, were, uh, their medical records were reviewed, and the ones where there was a single twin which said, I am, I define myself as homosexual, they then checked, what about the other twin? And in the case where there were identical twins, which means that they came from the same egg and have the same DNA, 
there was a much higher concordance, much higher agreement that both twins were either homosexual or both twins were not homosexual than in the case of twins that are not identical twins. The reason why they use twins is the belief and the understanding that even the non-identical twins had, were raised in the same environment. So it's a way of separating the genetics from the environment. That said, many identical twins, including uh, one pair that I've known personally, one of them was gay and the other one was straight. And other than that, they seem totally identical. So there's a lot we don't understand. Wow. But there definitely is a biological component. Uh, we need to take a little break, uh, Peter. So just hang in there a little bit, and we'll be right back. Okay. The weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. For today, more clouds and sun with a couple of showers and a heavy thunderstorm around, especially this afternoon. It could be the localized flooding, the high today, 86 to 90. Tonight, partly to mostly cloudy with a couple of showers and a thunderstorm, though 72 to 76. More clouds and sun tomorrow with a couple of showers and a heavy thunderstorm or two around, mainly during the afternoon hours, high 86 to 90. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Joe Lundberg. Ah, ouch. Does pain have you glued to the couch? Yes, unfortunately it's true that every year we must get older, but that doesn't mean we have to deal with pain in our back, knees, or shoulder. If your muscles and joints are sore, don't worry anymore. Come get acupuncture from me and you'll be pain-free. Acupuncture starts as low as $35 at a Better You Healthcare. Call me, Dr. Erica Olstein, at 615-5566. Stop your pain from driving you insane. If you're anything like I was, the thought of getting older was the last thing on your mind. But here we are. For me, it started slowly. The lack of energy. Never being in the mood. And when I was, I could never perform at my best. I tried the pills and other treatments with minimal results. And all but given up on my sex life. Then, I found the doctors at New Male Medical Center. Wow! They made a new male out of me. Feel like I'm 25 again. I have renewed vigor, so much more energy, and no longer worry about my performance. New Male treated me like my situation was one of a kind. With a custom treatment plan that really works, I feel great. They can create one for you too. It does not matter if you suffer from low testosterone, erectile dysfunction, or just want to last longer. New Male will help you. Call New Male Medical Center today at 352-404-4779. 352-404-4779. That's 352-404-4779. It will change your life. 352-404-4779. Good credits, bad credits. It's none of our business because we're not an auto dealer. We're not a bank. We're not your mother. We're Ocala for Sale.com. Marion County's marketplace for cars, trucks, and SUVs. We've got thousands of sellers standing by to take your call. No middleman. But hurry, don't walk, don't run. Just sit down and log on to Ocala for Sale.com. Prices and inventory change daily. Offer does not include dealer up charge. Undercutting rust proofing factory surcharge or delivery fee. See website for details. Uh, 12 minutes before 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. It's kind of an interesting interesting topic it's a very interesting topic our our sexuality and and our well, everything about sex the book that we're talking about is sex love and dna it's written by peter shatner who is a scientist etc he's got lots of credentials what molecular biology teaches us about being human peter i want to i want to tell you something um the the actor nathan lane am i saying his name right right yes nathan lane from broadway he's wonderful yeah he, he is um peter are you still with us Yes, I'm here. Okay. The the actor, Nathan Lane, one time said something about... Uh, he was on a talk show, and he was being funny, as he always is. And he said, uh, oh, I like Broadway, I like dancing, I like musicals. What do you think I am? Of course I'm gay, right? This is what he said. And and I'm, I was listening to him going, wait a minute, I like Broadway, I like musicals. <laughs> I don't dance, but I like watching it, uh, and I am not gay in, in any way. But but it was it's an interesting thing to think that somebody who, like socially, I guess we think, okay, if he loves sports, he must be more masculine. If he loves Broadway, he must be more feminine. In, in both cases, I'm referring to a guy who likes those two things, by the way. Um, nobody says that about women. Nobody does that about women. I, I, know, I know. We're left out. I know. You're called... Uh, uh, what do they call girls? Uh, tomboys. Oh, tomboys. tomboys. Yeah. There you go. But but isn't isn't that all social stuff though? Isn't doesn't that really have nothing to do with science? Uh, probably. Um, I mean, I I don't know. I don't know studies of of how many. Uh, 
uh, gay and straight men are hairdressers and how many aren't. But, you know, there are certain stereotypes and things are right. social. Certainly these things, there's certainly nothing in our DNA that says become a hairdresser. Um, so probably these things are completely social, but I'm not aware of, of uh, specific studies that have looked at anything like that. So do, do, we, do we use the information that helps us... Uh identify the factual parts of this in any way? Does it help us change our minds? I, I, I guess as a country, we're trying to come to grips with this. And you know why? It's because our sons and our daughters are so important to us. And, and if, if we've never known somebody who was gay and suddenly your son tells you he is... I mean, you have to love him. You can't not love him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and not that, you don't, not that you don't want to not love him. You want to love him. That's, of course, 100% correct. Uh, the sad news is that historically there have been many situations where the parents then don't love them. I know, I know. And uh, what one of the, it's not the science, but one of the lessons that comes out of the science is that when one looks at the situations of, of folks who are gay or folks who, have trans, who are transgender, that their problems... The really deep problems are rarely from their biology or from the ways in which they're different. It's from the ways that other people treat them because of the fact that they're different. And my hope is that by learning more about the science and learning that this is all natural diversity and it makes us as a species actually stronger, uh, which is what one way that evolution works, is that we will learn to treat one another with more dignity and respect, no matter what diverse uh, exceptions we may be to some biological rule or another. Yeah, because some people treat that as a uh, disease, and I just don't understand that. Well, sadly, until I don't know exactly how many, maybe 20 years ago, the um, official American Psychological and Medical Associations treated homosexuality as a disease. Um, of course, a disease is a value judgment. It isn't something from science. Uh, you can, you know, a disease means it's something different and it's bad. And the, some, the fact that it's different, I mean, we are different. We're all different. Some have blue eyes and some have brown eyes. Mm -hmm. um, but some differences between us are labeled as being bad. And certainly if someone has cystic fibrosis, one could argue that's bad or some other dread disease. But the understanding that's come, over the, come to the scientific and medical community in the last 20 years is the differences in sexuality are generally not bad, and they're just differences. And uh, but they are treated as bad by many people in society. Are, are there cultures in, in history that, and, um, where it's a matriarchal culture, and are there studies regarding the sexuality there? Where the where because in our culture it's considered a patriarchal society where the the man is is the head of the household, etc. Yeah, and, you know it's it's changed a lot since when I was a kid, but. But the, the matriarchal ones, the ones where the mother was considered the boss and the, and the go-to person, is, did they have... My understanding is that there are many such societies. We're now heading outside the realm of my expertise. So I, I won't be able, you know, but I believe there are many uh, such soci uh, societies and that they function just fine. I do know that there are many animal species where, which are patriarchal, and there are many animal species that are matriarchal. And uh, the matriarchal ones do just fine. Did uh, Bruce Jenner have a choice? I mean, when he chose to become Caitlin, was there something that he could choose not to do that and just kind of push that area of himself away to forget, or is it too strong? Well, specifically, in the case of Bruce Jenner, one can just listen to what he says. And uh, uh, he says he, you know, he's felt that way since he was six years old or seven years old, and I totally, I totally believe it. Um, that's the most common, uh, the common thing. One, one can, of course, choose not to tell anyone about it. One can choose to, as they used to say, be in the closet. Um, but the, the, the biological feelings are overwhelmingly reported as starting at a very, very young age, whether it's sexual orientation or whether it's uh, gender dysphoria, as it's called. And the, uh, the data is also overwhelming that for people who have tried to change specifically from being more homosexual to heterosexual, uh, the, suc the success rate, in quotation marks, is extremely low and is, after, is many, many years 
and is very, very painful, and by and large is not possible. There, there was a statement made by Dr. Ruth once that um, once you are sexualized, then you are sexualized for life, and sexualized, the way I understood it, was simply to have an orgasm. The first time that happens for you, you are, you're in, you're in the club, right? <laughs> and, okay, now, that to me contradicts what I remember experiencing as a child. Because as a child, I remember being very attracted to the little girls in my class, and yet I had no sexual, it wasn't sexual at all. It was just an attraction that I don't, there's no way I could explain it. It was just, I liked them, you know? It was like, yeah, I like sitting next to you. I like sharing my milk with you, and uh, mm -hmm. that, that kind of thing, you know? It wasn't... Uh, absolutely. I, I don't know where Dr. Ruth came, for, came up with that particular statement. I'm unfamiliar with any experiment which specifically says that having an orgasm has any kind of an effect like that and and I I don't believe that's correct. Uh it what I'm what my under, everything I've read in the literature and all the experiments and studies I'm familiar with indicate that it's something that starts probably already while before you're born prenatally. There's a lot of uh a lot of activity that happens in uh in your sexual development both in your ovaries or testes but at least as important in the brain. And that by the time you're, you're born, and certainly by the time you're five, six years old, a lot of uh, the, your sexual uh, perception, self-identity, and attraction has been set. Well, when children are playing, uh, I always have a problem with those people that say, oh, boys shouldn't play with the kitchen, they shouldn't play with dolls, uh, girls shouldn't play with uh, 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 a toy, water pistols, things like that. I think children just play because they enjoy playing and they enjoy pretending, and I just don't understand why uh, boys and girls should be, you know, have different toys. What do you think? No, I, I, I agree that you shouldn't be worried about it. It is interesting that there have been experiments on newborns, uh, not newborns, but uh, infants who are maybe three months old, just, just old enough that they can actually reach out and grab something. Mm -hmm. And the newborn, the infant boys, r given the choice, will tend to reach out and grab a car rather than a doll. And the, the infant girls will, re will reach out and grab a doll rather than grab a boy. Uh, Grab a, grab, in a car. grab a car. Oh, now that's and fascinating. So, so this kind of behavior seems to be ingrained in us, uh, in our biology. But that it's, you know, I certainly don't think there's any need to be pushing that upon a little child. They'll do it automatically. Exactly. As much yeah. or as little as they need to. Yeah. yeah, let them be themselves. Can we raise, exactly. one of the chapters is titled, Can We Raise the Dead? And you start off with a story about a Spanish mountain goat that was actually extinct and brought back to life for a few minutes, I think. What I can't remember. Exactly. Now. Yeah, sadly, only for a few minutes, yes. So that's pretty cool. That's a pretty cool thing. So the, the whole G Jurassic Park thing could actually come true. Well, it's a... Uh, it's a long way from, from that Ibex to Jurassic Park. Uh, the biggest difference, I mean, it could, but the, chance, the chances of it happening in our lifetime or even our kids' lifetime is very small. The biggest, the biggest problem is in the case of the Ibex, there is a close subspecies that is still around and that could be used as a surrogate mother for this, for this uh, egg of the extinct animal. In the case... In the case, for example, of uh, people have talked about the, the mammoth, which is a little more realistic than, than Jurassic Park, mm -hmm. it, it was having using an elephant as a surrogate mother. And even there, uh, it's extremely difficult. There are big differences between an elephant and a mammoth, not to mention between a dinosaur and other animals. So, yes... In principle, maybe it could happen, but the, at the moment, the technological obstacles are really huge in the case of the dinosaurs. The case of the Ibex is something else. It'll be really cool if we could bring that back to life. Wow. What, is, what is also really huge is the amount of information in your book, and, and we've probably done it a disservice by focusing on the sexual part of this, but it was fascinating to us, and hopefully for you and the listeners. But let me just tell the listeners, the book is way more than that. It's called Sex, Love, and DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Shatner wrote the book. I have a copy of it. Call me if you want the copy that was sent to us. Peter, do you have a website so the rest of us can buy it? Absolutely. Uh, I suggest either going to my website, which is petershatner.com, or else just go to Amazon and type in Sex, Love, and DNA. Great I'm conversation. Nice. Peter, thank you so much for being on the air with us. It was a fascinating conversation, and uh, again, it was even, didn't even scratch the surface of what the book uh, includes. Thank you, Peter. 
Thank you. All right, we'll be right back. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 96.3 FM, The Source. Radio. I'm Lillian Wu. A not guilty plea a short while ago from the former University of Cincinnati police officer who shot and killed a driver after stopping him for driving without a front license. The defendant is facing the possibility of life in prison. It's the court du- court's duty to ensure his appearance. The bond will be one million anyway. The judge rejecting the defense's contention that Ray Tensing was not a flight risk. The Hamilton County prosecutor, Joe Dieter, says he is so outraged over what he has seen that he's not going to pawn this off on an assistant state's attorney. He's going to prosecute this case himself. Fox's Mike Tobin, Tensing's attorney, says his client feared for his life and didn't intend to kill Samuel DuBose. Investigators looking into whether a piece of aircraft wing washed up from the Indian Ocean could belong to the missing Malaysian airliner, and our economy grew at a rate of 2.3% in the second quarter. Fox News. We report you this guy. Okay, so let me see if I get this straight. You want the truck with the most towing power, the most payload, that accelerates faster, stops quicker, handles better than ever, that works smarter, is loaded with a ton of new technology.